This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. It's a Blood Red Podcast courtesy of the Liverpool Echo as Liverpool await confirmation over Friday night's FA Cup third round tie at Villa Park. I'm Guy Clark. Welcome along as we preview Friday's Cup outing, whether or not the game will even take place, plus the importance of the Reds' FA Cup campaign. All that, as well as our team selections and match predictions, results, not whether the game takes place. Alongside me, Matt Addison and Dan K. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. We're recording this rather later on Thursday evening than we'd initially anticipated. We'd watched Jurgen Klopp's press conference this afternoon, thought we had plenty to talk about, Matt. And then on Thursday afternoon, the news breaking that significant COVID outbreak at Aston Villa's training ground. And all of a sudden, this game is in serious doubt. Yeah, we're still waiting, aren't we, to find out the full extent of this. And, you know, it's a, a very strange situation, isn't it, that we're in at the moment. This is, I think, going to become more and more normal over the next few weeks. I think we're going to have a few examples of this. And this isn't the only FA Cup game, obviously. Our focus is mainly on Liverpool, but Southampton's game has been called off. I think there's four or five other ones as well, which are either already off or are in doubt. So, yeah, I think, you know, we, we've sort of had to, to come to terms with a few different things, haven't we, over the last few months because of, of coronavirus and the sort of implications that that has had. And this is the latest example. It's obviously not directly hit Liverpool in terms of the outbreak being in Liverpool squad, but it's going to have a huge impact on Liverpool, whether this game goes on or not. The knock-on effect of that, when we find out, you know, when the, the postponement potentially or if Liverpool were to get a buy it's going to set, I think, a precedent for other matches in the tournament. It's going to have a knock-on effect on Liverpool's fixtures going forward. I think it helps Liverpool if the game is on in terms of just having another game before that Manchester United match, which you know I'm sure we're going to come on to. But yeah, at this moment in time, we, we are still waiting for all of the, the details to emerge. Dan, what's your take on it all? Well, it's. I mean, as, as Matt said, I think this is something that's we are if we're not already used to it then we're certainly going to have to get used to it because this is the the covid reality that we are living in and will continue to be living in for quite some time yet i fear until you know the government gets its act together and sorts out this vaccine um we've we've in the last half an hour so we've just put a, we've we've put a story up news coming out of our, our sister title in birmingham birmingham live who were who suggesting that villa are preparing to put an under 23 team out which I think we've already heard Derby County will be doing similar in their FA Cup tie. And I, I couldn't really help be struck by the irony if that was to actually play out, because obviously the last time Liverpool played there in a cup tie, what, 13 months ago, it was Liverpool who were forced to play a team full of kids. Now, obviously, it was a completely different reason. It was because the match was scheduled and clashed with the, the Club World Cup in Qatar rather than COVID. But... You know, at the end of the day, there was there was a, there was a certain degree of intransigence, certainly from the the footballing authority, if not necessarily from Aston Villa themselves. And you know, as 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 I've said, it looks like you know, the, the word we're getting is that Villa are looking at putting a, a reserve, you know, a, a, a young team out. But if there was a suggestion that they wanted to get the game called off because of this, it would be really interesting to see what Liverpool's reaction would be, bearing in mind the situation they found themselves in last December. Yeah, certainly, as you say, that, that news out of Birmingham Live, our sister title, saying that training was cancelled on Thursday morning off the back of results, which came back on Wednesday, the uh, 6th of January. Aston Villa confirming then that they've closed their Bodymore Heath training ground after a significant coronavirus outbreak. Matt, we've also heard today that Shrewsbury Town's uh, away game with Southampton's been postponed. Of course, that was going to be taking place on Saturday. Going to find out early next week what's going to happen with that game. As Dan said, Derby County pretty much through the course of the week have been making it known that they're going to send an under-23 side to take on non-league Chorley. It's all getting very murky and very messy. We've had since Project Restart six or seven months now of football that we said right at the beginning of the restart outbreaks could happen. But over the last two weeks, having gone from having 2,000 fans at Anfield and getting excited about the possibility of that being sort of ramped up, we're now all of a sudden seeing games being postponed left, right and centre. And now it involves Liverpool. Yeah, I mean, those 2,000 fans inside Anfield seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it? I mean, who knows when that's going to happen again? I mean, look, I, I took a look at the, the regulations from the FA going into this season. They had put 
a few different bits into their files in terms of what will happen if this, this sort of thing happens. I think it was entirely predictable, as you say, that you know, we expected at some point something similar, whether that was in the FA Cup, whether that was in another competition. You know, We expected something to happen along these lines, and they essentially say that it will be on a case-by-case basis. So, I mean, we talk about the, the precedent being set. Well, that isn't necessarily going to be the case that, you know, whatever happens in this Liverpool match might be a different outcome compared to what happens in the Southampton match. So, yeah, at, at this stage, we don't know exactly what's going to happen if um, the game was to be postponed and rearranged. That would make it incredibly difficult. Aston Villa have already got games in hand in the Premier League to play. They've already got know fixtures to to catch up on in that regard i mean the only other slots that they've got free at this moment in time are future rounds of the fa cup so to sort of postpone and and put that back especially considering what is it three weeks until round four of the fa cup it's going to be incredibly difficult to, to sort of find a slot for that to go in so obviously it's not an ideal situation but i think the the most logical thing if the game can't go ahead on friday would be for Liverpool to, to get a buy and, and go through, as we've seen actually in the Carabao Cup earlier this season, we saw uh, Tottenham got through, I think on that basis, I can't remember the team off the top of my head that they were playing against, but their opponents couldn't feel the team. That is what had to happen. And unfortunately, I think that might be the way if this game can't go ahead in some form that, that may just have to happen because there are just only so many you know slots in the, the fixture list over the next few weeks. It's already crazy. You know, we, we can't be putting off these games for too long. Yeah, late in Orient, as you say, that that was that uh, Carabao Cup game that had to be postponed and Spurs given a bye in that. And of course, they've made use of it and got themselves through to the final. Anyway, uh, Dan, looking at maybe the wider picture, we saw back in March, it was a, a positive for Arsenal manager Mikel Arteta that saw the lockdown of football initially. Now we're seeing the words sort of significant and plenty serious outbreaks. We're seeing sort of all of these words put together about eight outbreaks at, at individual clubs. Is it wise for football to keep going or am I being a bit too sort of dramatic asking that? I don't think you're being dramatic, Guy. I think it's a perfectly fair question. I think a lot of people both within the football bubble and outside the football bubble will be asking that same question. Um, I mean, I remember talking before football even came back in the summer when there was talk of Project Restart and I remember... I mean, listen, even in the best of times, football is there to act as a blessed relief for us from the stresses and strains of everyday life, the human condition and all the rest of it. And, you know, you can, as a football fan, absolutely, it's 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 helped us all get through this really difficult period. But the point that I was making in April, May and June is that these footballers are still human beings with families and friends and loved ones and everything else. And should they be being put at extra risk to effectively be performing seals for the rest of the country. Now, you know, obviously the latest figures of tests were released yesterday, weren't they? And it was the biggest number in, was it 40? It, 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 it was certainly the biggest number in a long time. So the numbers have risen, but by and large, and this is, you know, this is the lie the Premier League even going with lately, they are confident in the, you know, in the security of the biosphere, whatever you call it, environments that they're creating for the players. And, Certainly, you know, during you know up, up until now, those numbers have been kept relatively low. But obviously, we we Christmas and the build up to Christmas is an um, was is and was an unprecedented period during this pandemic. And the reality is, we're not going to know the real, yeah, you know, but because of the the inevitable delay and the, the staggered nature of when results and positive tests come through, because obviously, you know, the virus can incubate for what, ten to fourteen days in some people. It's we, you know, it's only really now and probably over the next week or so that we will start to see the true impact of what Christmas and mixing did, and obviously the delays that the government put into place as regards locking things down. If if they were to call it off, I certainly wouldn't have any complaints about it. I would be a bit frustrated and you know wonder what what's going to happen to the rest of the season. But at the end of the day, this is a public health crisis. The likes of us, none of us have ever lived through before, and that has to take priority. We hope football can continue, but if it can't, then we'll just have to live with it because some things are more important. Yeah, and it doesn't really matter if we're talking about Aston Villa fielding an under-23 side. We had the same arguments, obviously, the other way, and as Dan sort of alluded to, for very different reasons when 
Liverpool sent the kids there in a, a Carabao Cup quarter final last season, but it doesn't really sort of have the true reflection of the occasion that it is and the two sides that are playing up against one another, does it? No, it wouldn't. It would be, you know, a, a sad sort of state because I think, you know, Aston Villa this season have been fantastic. I think they've been a really good team to watch. Liverpool were on the end, of course, of a hammering the last time they went to Villa Park. So I think it, it would have been an amazing game. It, it would have been one that I think both sides probably took really seriously. And it doesn't look like they're going to be allowed to, to be able to do that. So it is a, a bit of a shame in that. But, you know, I think that the big thing for me in terms of the, the sort of why the picture of it, if you like, is that we just have to be guided by the science, for want of a better phrase. If football is stopped or if certain things have to happen going forward, then, you know, so be it if that's the right thing to do. But I think we have to be guided by what is the right thing to do rather than, you know, some sort of, of greed or or wanting null and void for, for different reasons. I think it, it's very, very difficult, as we discussed throughout the summer to sort of differentiate, you know, which clubs want the football season to be stopped for, for which reasons. So, yeah, we, we could almost be back in that situation where we were, you know, a few months ago in, in April, May, whenever it was before Project Restart, where we are talking about our matches being called off for the right reasons, the wrong reasons. Is it to do with escaping relegation? Is it to do with stopping certain teams winning the Premier League, for example? What I don't want is to, to sort of get back into that situation. As long as, you know, everybody has agreed that the facts are, are there and, and it's only right that football stops, then then so be it. But it's going to be very, very interesting to, to sort of see what happens with this Villa game, but with matches going forward as well, because as much as, you know, we have to, to sort of be guided by that, I think there's always going to be other factors that will come into the influence as well. And it's not just this game, is it, Dan, that it would sort of, I suppose, threaten the integrity of things. You look at even the Premier League, just having a look there at Aston Villa's fixtures. I think if they've now got to close the training ground down for, for two weeks, they could miss as many as three Premier League games as well as, of course, this FA Cup game. So then that's a backlog. Obviously, they've got one of those rearranged games that they've got to play with Manchester City from the start of the season. It would be one of those three. So it'd be effectively an additional two on the game in hand they've already got. You're going to then have teams having to try and play catch up in sort of March, April and even into May. We've got to finish the season by the end of May because we've got the Euros in the summer. It's all getting very, very messy again. It is. I mean, I heard, I read something the other day that basically said the Euros in the summer is absolutely sacrificed, absolutely sacrosanct and cannot and will not be moved. I mean, is, is that true? I mean, I, I, if it is, I, I, don't, I don't know how anyone can make any kind of great claims with any degree of certainty yes the euros are important but if the situ you know but but so so is the health of the footballers and the integrity of the competition and if say clubs are asked to pay four games in a week or whatever then you know i, I don't really think that that's an ideal scenario at all you know obviously we hope things can be completed on time it's already a very compressed season and we've seen what that means in terms of the you know, the quality of the football at times, certainly in the in the early weeks there was all loads of mad score lines, wasn't there? And everyone was buzzing off that and loving it. I think as the seasons wore on, and yeah, you know, you know, I'm sure we'll get onto it, but Liverpool in particular have looked jaded, physically and mentally jaded, and I think a lot of teams are feeling like that. Obviously, having to play the you know the major, you know virtually all the games in front of no fans doesn't help that, but I, I do think that there has to be a certain degree of flexibility. And if, if they have to push the Euros back, then they should push the Euros back. I mean, it's not up to me, but that's my opinion. Does it only, though, does it wait until you mentioned sort of greed and things like that, Matt, that sort of govern the game? It is money that sort of sees what happens in the game. I mean, is it only until we get an outbreak like this that involves a team like Liverpool, involves the Premier League, that we might see sort of things taken more seriously regarding a stop? Because you look at, for example, the League One table, John Coleman, who's the Accrington Stanley manager who comes on the Alley LaRouge podcast quite often, his side are four games in hand already in League One. That That's an astonishing amount at that level. Yet, I suppose it's not until it, it really trickles up to the Premier League, the big boys, and Jurgen Klopp has to say, we can't fit these games in for actually, I suppose, governing bodies to take a stance. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to argue with that, isn't it? The facts are there. You, you talk about the, the games, you know, if you look at, at the League One, League Two tables, everyone seemingly played a different amount of games and it, it's not quite that bad in the Premier League. But I mean, 
right from the start. You know, we knew that Manchester United and Manchester City had the first game week off. So right from the start, there was sort of differing levels of, of how far teams had progressed. Matches since then have been called off. I'm sure matches, you know, if not the entire league gets postponed, then, you know, certain individual matches going forward are going to be. So it's a really difficult one to, to sort of assess, isn't it? Other than the fact that it is down to the finances, it is down to the money. There's more money in the Premier League. There's more people who are bothered about a Liverpool or a Manchester United than there are further down. And, you know, unfortunately, that is, you know, the, the way that these things are, are decided, as I say, it, it does tend to come down to, to money and finances and things like that. I think you look at the, the Carabao Cup, the FA Cup, if it wasn't for money, then did we really need to, to have those competitions for certainly the, the teams who are in Europe this season, did Liverpool need to be in those competitions, bearing in mind all of the other sort of factors? Well, probably not from a, a footballing perspective, but economically, it's obviously a huge thing for those sponsors and, and cup competitions to have these teams in it. So ultimately, that it, it does always come down to, to the money and the exposure and the television rights and, and stuff like that. But look, it is what it is. We're, we are this far into the season and whatever happens from, from now onwards I think will be dictated largely by the economics but there's nothing we can do about it that's just the way that that football is at this moment in time let's move on then to the uh, serious stuff let's leave the the cynicism to the side as to whether football should and will continue Dan how important then is this FA Cup campaign we're on the eve of Liverpool starting it I've seen the videos going around on, on social media of Xabi Alonso's goal at L uh, Luton Town what back in 2005 was that one 2004 2006, it was 15 years ago today yeah 15 day. yeah unbelievable this competition mm -hmm. has meant so much obviously Liverpool went and won the the tournament in 2006 how important is it again then for Liverpool maybe to, to have a tilt at the FA Cup they've never really taken it all too seriously under Jurgen Klopp they haven't and you know for some for, you know, for quite a lot of Liverpool supporters including myself that is a sort of of some regret I do understand why I do understand his reasons but if you look at both domestic cup competitions, you know, watching the Manchester derby last night, like I'm sure a lot of people, and sure at one point during the commentary, they made reference to the fact that, you know, the, the you look at the majority of winners, I think really apart from Swansea in 2013 and Birmingham a couple of years before that, over the last 15 odd years, the majority of the winners have been the teams that have been competing near the top of the Premier League, the likes of Mourinho, um, Obviously, he's got a different kind of motive to try and win it now at Tottenham. But when he was at Chelsea, you know that they were always keen to hoover up a trophy as soon as possible. Now, obviously, the likes of Mourinho, certainly in his first year at Chelsea under Abramovich, had pretty much unlimited funds, could buy whatever squads he wanted. And I, I do get and understand why Jurgen Klopp has taken the view and the approach to the FA Cup that he has done. But I'm of an age, I'm of an era being born in the late 70s and growing up in the 80s, where the FA Cup is 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 and always will be really special to me. I mean, there's an argument to say if there's one competition Liverpool should always take seriously, it's the FA Cup. Um, you know, and just just going back to the, to 2006, you know, 15 years since Liverpool last won it. I mean, it, it, it's true with any cup competition, but you look at look at Liverpool's route route to Cardiff that year. Luton and well, uh, Luton were. I think in the second tier of the championship. At the yeah, time. they were in the championship. Yeah, and it was, it was a fantastic game live on the telly. I was in the in the tiny little away end at Kenilworth Road. I think in the fourth round we played Portsmouth away, but after that, Man United at home, seven 0 away at Birmingham, Chelsea were just about to clinch the second ch title in a row under, under Mourinho, and then West Ham in, in another epic final. You know, it was a great FA Cup run. I was you know, in 1992, I remember when Liverpool won it, they only played one top-flight team in the whole run, Aston Villa, ironically, in the quarterfinals. So you, you get who you get in the cup draws, but listen, Liverpool have never won the treble of the league, the Champions League and the FA Cup. Manchester United have. It's a big ask in any season, let alone this season. But I want Liverpool to win the FA Cup every year and it disappoints me when we don't take it seriously, even if I understand the reasons why. So I hope whether we're playing the Villa under, under fours or their first team tomorrow, I hope we win and I hope we go all the way because 15 years is too long to go without winning the FA Cup in my book. Yeah, nothing wrong with with dreaming. And I suppose that FA Cup winning in 2006, as you say, 15 years on now. But 
the last real great FA Cup final that is named after a player, the Stephen Gerrard FA Cup final, of course. Matt, though, what are your feelings on the FA Cup? And is this game important to start an FA Cup run that sees Liverpool lifting the cup at Wembley? Or is it more important as a use of a warm-up for Manchester United coming to Anfield? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you wouldn't say no to winning any competition. I think it's firmly at the bottom of my priorities going forward. I think Liverpool have to, to retain the Premier League. They have to go far in the Champions League, certainly further than what they managed last season. So, yeah, the FA Cup is, is firmly a number three on that list. But for me, the, the game with Aston Villa is hugely important for a very different reason. It's to make sure that they are ready and they are bounced back and they're confident, ready for this huge game with Manchester United. I mean... Liverpool have, have been in a poor run of form. I think this represents an opportunity to put an end to this sort of idea that they're not very good away from home. I think they've only won one of their last seven away games in all competitions. This is an opportunity for them to put an end to that. It's an opportunity for them to, to put together some form in terms of their attacking, in terms of their counter-attacking, their creativity. I think this is a huge game for Liverpool to just put themselves back on track, really, and I'd be going strong in the game. I think, you know, possibly the, the fact that Aston Villa can't will maybe change it in some people's minds. But for me, you've got to, to go pretty much with Liverpool's first choice 11. I think there'd be one or two changes that I'd make. I think Andy Robertson, for example, could do with a rest. But for the rest of this team, I think it's, it's hugely important that Jurgen Klopp puts out a team which can sort of get themselves and, and play themselves back into form, if you like. We know that... You know, this Liverpool squad and, and team and manager don't like big breaks. They're going to have, what is it, nine days anyway, as it is from Aston Villa to Manchester United. I think this is a, a big one for, for Liverpool to prepare themselves and, and put themselves in the right state of mind ahead of you know, what is probably the biggest game of the season so far against Manchester United, who could, of course, by that Sunday, be top of the Premier League by three points. Yeah, certainly deriding the FA Cup there. I wasn't sure if it was Joe Rimmer with a, a Matt Addison mask on to begin with, but I think it's you, Matt. Anyway, uh, Dan, talking of sort of team strength and the lineups with which Liverpool should go, we've spoken at, at length already about the fact that Aston Villa might be forced to play uh, a weakened squad. Do you think that will change Jurgen Klopp's thinking at all? Or do you think regardless, it's about Liverpool and maybe a case of putting the best out there and getting them to, to just play their way back into form? Yeah, I think if we know anything about Jurgen Klopp is that generally he will always look at things through a Liverpool tinted lens. And I'm sure you know the, the developments on Thursday afternoon will not really have much of a, an impact on the team that he's decided to put out, which he's probably already been cogitating and thinking about over the course of the week and has probably already largely settled on in his mind. He, he mentioned in, in the press conference on Thursday afternoon that Takumi Minamino is, is likely to feature which I think makes a lot of sense. I mean, like a, like a few people, I've been slightly perplexed over the last three games, given the way Minamino started, scored and played pretty well at Crystal Palace, that he's literally not stepped onto the pitch since. And it's not exactly like Liverpool have been putting up too many trees in the three matches since then either. Um, so I, I think, he, you know, I, I agree with Matt to a certain extent. I, I think he'll mix it up. A, I'd be surprised, for example, if you saw... Fabinho and um, Henderson at the back again, or if you saw all three of the front three starts, I think you know the likes of Shakiri, Minamino, Curtis Jones, who, who arguably, to be fair, has actually been a first choice, first team player for most of the season, but hasn't figured much in the last couple of weeks. Would imagine he might come back in, possibly Milner in one of the full back positions, possibly Nico Williams. I think I, obviously it'll clearly be a stronger team than than the last Liverpool team to play a cup tie at Villa Park last December. I think it'll be a kind of middle of the road team, but I, I agree absolutely. It's a it's a very important match in terms of Liverpool's need to just restore a bit of positivity. It's amazing how quickly things can change in football, isn't it? It's only what three weeks, less than three weeks since that seven nil annihilation of, of Roy Hodgson's Crystal Palace at, at Selhurst Park, and everyone was going on about what a team this is, the league again. I know it takes us three games, and you know. Five consecutive halves without a goal, isn't it? And all of a sudden, people are talking about crisis, crises. Um, all things are relative, you know. I think, particularly where Liverpool were in, you know, late October, early November, with Van Dijk and Gomez, you know, the the heart of the central defence ripped out. 
if you'd have said that Liverpool would go into New Year top of the league, qualify for the Champions League, I think we'd all have taken that. The fact is, you know, Liverpool supporters have been spoiled by what happened last season. You know, repeat it till you're blue in the face. What happened last season is not normal. Teams do not normally win leagues by being 25 points clear in February. It was a freak occurrence. It might never happen again. Just because they have, just because they're not doing it this season, doesn't mean they're, they're, they're rubbish now. It's just, it's just a bit more normal in a season that's anything but normal. So I still think Liverpool are better than any other team in the league, even if God forbid Manchester United come to Anfield and beat us a week on Sunday, which, which I don't see happening. But they, they, they do have a very good away, away record. But you know, one thing at a time. Liverpool hopefully can f- focus on a match on Friday night and get a few goals win the match, restore that kind of feel-good factor, and then prepare for the um, for the visit of Solskjaer's side to Anfield, which is a big game, but, you know, only one of, of a number of big games that we'll all have in 2021. I think in February, Everton and Man City are both due at Anfield as well, and obviously we'll, we'll see the Champions League ramp up again. So, inevitably, Liverpool, Liverpool and Manchester United, the two biggest clubs in world football, arguably, certainly the two biggest clubs in British football, so with United being near the top of the league, inevitably there's going to be extra hype regarding a potential title battle between the two. But one thing Jurgen Klopp has been very good at throughout his time at Liverpool is stripping away all the nonsense and all the, the background minutiae uh, and just focusing on the task at hand. And I'm sure that when we do get to next weekend and the United game is looming, Liverpool will be prepared for it. But first off, for, you know, you can only beat the team in front of you. And whether that's, like I say, Aston Villa's kids or their first team or a mixture of the two, Liverpool need to go there and get their first win of the new year because all of a sudden that 7 0 win at Palace feels a long time ago. Yeah, worth noting Jurgen Klopp's press conference in full. You can catch it on our Blood Red podcast feed or the the dedicated Blood Red YouTube channel, wherever you are uh, listening or or watching into this. Matt, Dan alluded to it there. Two games without a goal, three games without a a win. Jurgen Klopp confirming in his press conference, Liverpool unlikely to go for a, a central defender during the January transfer window. It will be a game, really, that offers the chance to as Dan said, restore some positivity, if nothing else. Yeah, I think so. And that's why I think really they'll go as strong as possible. As I say, I think there will be one or two changes. I think it would be a risk, for example, to play Fabinho. But then there is that question of who do you play there instead? Do you want to, to have Rhys Williams together uh, with you know another young option? Potentially, I suppose that would be not a, a bad thing if Aston Villa can't put together their first team, which we know is is now the case. I think that makes that slightly easier. I'd be surprised if we saw Andy Robertson. I think James Milner can, can sort of slot in there and, and do that left-back role. But for the rest of the team, I think it, it's going to largely be a pretty strong one, or, or certainly that's what I would be doing, because as I say, it's a chance to, to sort of get back into that groove. I don't think there's you know any need to, to rest players given... Um, the, the eight, nine day gap until the next match. I just think it, it's one of those chances really that, that Liverpool don't have too often to to go and, and put a few goals in, restore some confidence, banish this sort of negativity which is around the club in terms of, of creativity and, and scoring goals and just put themselves back on the right track. So I think it's a, a huge opportunity and I think you know, that there is a time and a, a place to be putting a few youngsters in or, or to be you know, handing opportunities to one or two players on the, the fringes of the squad. But for me, the last three games have, have changed my outlook after, you know, Crystal Palace, that 7-0 win. If you'd have said to me, do Liverpool need to, to play a really strong team against Aston Villa to restore some confidence? I'd have, you know, I'd have just laughed at you because it, it just felt like such a, a long way away. But, you know, the, the results that have happened since then, I think, have, have changed the approach, really. And it's not so much in terms of the importance of the FA Cup, but the importance of the matches to follow. Doesn't take much for me to say for you to laugh at me, to be fair, Matt, but we'll, we'll move on from there. Let's go into uh, our team selector then and our, our match prediction as we do wrap things up. Dan, you're limbering up there. I'll come to, to you first. The goalkeeper and, and back four, how should Liverpool approach this? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Kevin Kelleher in goal. Um, Theo Squires wrote a piece for us this morning suggesting that yeah, the last two games at Villa, obviously the 5-0 that he started in, but actually performed quite well. And obviously the 7-2 win Adrian did not have 
a game to write home about has arguably kind of helped lead to that situation where he probably is Liverpool's number two goalkeeper behind Allison. So yeah, I, I would have no 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 problem with seeing being an Irish lad in goal. Um, I'd like to see Nico Williams at right back. I, I think Trent could do with the rest. He's obviously not in the best of form at the moment. Klopp get bigged him up in today's press conference quite rightly. Um, said publicly for the first time that Trent did have COVID in the summer. And he's obviously had an injury as well, which um, and yeah, which is an explanation for his in different recent form. Also, the fact that he's a young footballer and young footballers will go through peaks and troughs of form. He's still one of the best young scouters I've ever seen play for Liverpool. And I'm still hugely excited about his progress and some of the criticism he's got from some of the experts online really is beyond belief, but shouldn't be surprised at that nowadays, I suppose. So yeah, I'll have Nick, I'll have Nico at right back and uh, Jimmy Milner at left back. And to ask what yeah, I, I said before that I don't think Villa's situation will affect Liverpool's team selection. But Matt made the point then, it, it kind of occurred to me half what I was saying it as well. I think if Villa do play the kids, I think it's much easier for Klopp to play Phillips and Williams and give Fabinho a rest. So on that basis, I'm going to go for Nat Phillips and Reese Williams at, at, at centre-back. Well, we're, we're, we're starting off with a much changed side after saying we, we wouldn't maybe see as many changes. Matt, I'll let you have your say on the defence, what changes you might make and, and you can lead us on the midfield. Yeah, I'm going to go a little bit stronger. Uh, I think there's a, a time and a place for, for putting in the youngsters, but I think I'm going to go Alisson. I'm going to give Trent another go. I think it's an opportunity for, for him to play himself back into a little bit of form. Um, has been struggling. I think this is an ideal opportunity really for, for him. Uh, it did strike me when you mentioned there, Dan, about Nico Williams. Could he come in and, and play left back even? We've seen him yeah. do that before. Yeah. Um, I would be very tempted by that. So I think it's a, a toss up between bit between Williams and, and James Milner. But uh, I'll go with James Milner, but it wouldn't massively surprise me if, if Williams played there, maybe for a half, and, and then Milner had a half at left-back and a half in midfield or something like that. And yeah, the, the centre-backs, the fact that, that Villa are going to be playing a, a very young side makes that decision a lot easier for me. I think, you know, there's there's an argument that you would have had to have played Fabinho. I don't think that's the case anymore. So uh, yeah, the, the same as Dan at, at centre-back. Midfield gets slightly interesting. Um, I think Curtis Jones 100% will play. Um, I think he's you know, deserving of an opportunity in there. I'd be surprised if you saw um, someone like a, a Thiago in. Um, but yeah, the, there's a few different options. I think I'm going to go for a two. I think I'm going to go for, for Henderson and Jones in a two. Um, but you could convince me otherwise, depending on who you go for, Dan. Yeah. Huh. Uh, well, I was thinking Henderson will certainly play as the, as the captain, will certainly start the game. You know, he's, he's so good at setting the tempo and the tone for Liverpool, isn't he? And, and I think, particularly in a match like this, coming off the back of the run Liverpool are on, I think that's important. I'd agree with Curtis in there. And I'm going to throw uh, Minamino in, a, in as the third one in, in, a, in, a, in a deeper role. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll play three strikers. Should I go, so I'm going to crack on my strikers as well? Yeah, you might as well, mate. Yeah. I'm going to have Shakiri. Um, Mane and Origi. Right. Okay. So that is going to be fairly changed. Matt, what about you? What? Who's going to be your four-man strike force? Uh, Munamino will be in there. He'll be my number ten. Um, I am tempted by the idea of playing all of the usual three along with him. Um, I'm certainly going to go for Firmino and Salah. It's just a case of, of whether Origi comes in on the left. Do you know what? Yeah, I think Sadio, Sadio Mane is one that you can just throw him in and he's not as affected by rhythm as Firmino and, and Salah are. So, yeah, Sadio Mane can have a rest. I'll play Divock Origi off the left, Salah on the right, and then a Minamino and Firmino, 10 and 9. Yeah, that is interesting. I like the look of, of that when we've seen it, right? Last thing to, to do then, match predictions. I'm going to say the game's on. Dan, what's the score going to be? Aston Villa 1, Liverpool 3. All right, OK. Uh, and Matt? Uh, I I mean, I've no idea, have I? I don't know, 5-0 <laughs> Liverpool. 5-0, yeah, reverse of that. I reverse of that. Right, yeah, I was <laughs> going to say, Dan, Dan, you were the one who referenced the, 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 the game in the Carabao Cup. You should have gone with the 5-0. <laughs> I've schooled him well. 
Yeah, yeah, it's certainly right. Well, that's it from us here on this edition of the Blood Red podcast. Of course, by the time you listen to it, we may well know for definite if the game will be taking place. Stick across the Liverpool Echo website for all of the latest developments and should it take place, all of our match reaction, the live match blog, and of course, everything to come afterwards. We will also be uh, back on Blood Red after the game with the debrief and of course, the post-game podcast as well. But from myself, Guy Clark, Matt Addison and Dan K. Thanks for joining us here on Blood Red. Until next time, it's bye for now. <laughs>